Now for today's program. Danielle and Galit Dardashti are sisters and co-creators of The Nightingale of Iran, an award-winning documentary podcast series about their famous Persian Jewish family. Danielle Dardashti is an Emmy award-winning documentary writer and producer, a former TV news reporter, and a Moth Story Slam champion. Danielle helps companies tell stories through film and audio and leads corporate storytelling workshops. Dr. Galit Dardashti is a vocalist, composer, and anthropologist who studies Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews. In her new award-winning album, Mona Jat, she duets with samples of her famed Iranian grandfather. Galit is currently a fellow at UPenn's Cat Center. Joining Danielle and Galit today is Moment Deputy Editor Jennifer Barty. Please welcome Danielle and Galit Dardashti and Jennifer Barty. And welcome to uh, Galit and Danielle. It's wonderful to be here with you. Um, congratulations on your podcast, Nightingale of Iran. Uh, it's a six episode podcast that tells this really vivid story of your family, this multi-generational family and the power really of, of music and religion and culture and, and geography um, that, that play and politics too. And I guess I would add like serendipity and, and happenstance, um, all these things come together. And um, so I wanna you know, ask, we want to talk about your family story and and how it's portrayed in the podcast. Um, mindful that we don't want to spoil too much for viewers who haven't seen it, um, but I will say I think it's sort of like impossible to to ruin it because so much of what this is is the voice is voices of your your famous grandfather, the Nightingale of Iran, and your father, who uh, Farid, who is uh, you know a singing idol briefly in Iran as a young boy, and um, and then just the voices of of you, you singing and speaking and conversation and your your mother and so forth so i don't think we can ruin it too much i think we'll, we'll have a great conversation <laughs> thank you uh but um so i wanted to kind of start um you know the podcast is kind of as podcasts do you know create tension it's kind of premised on this mystery that you discover that you want to solve um and so i, I thought maybe we could start off by talking about what kind of what that mystery was that you discovered and um, maybe a good starting point is maybe you could touch on on your the origins of your family name, Dardashti, I think would be a cool place to start. Danielle, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, we we um, we get into a little bit about uh, the origins of the family name in episode two, I believe. Um, Dardasht was a Jewish town outside of Isfahan, on the outskirts of Isfahan. And um, if you were from Dardasht, you were Dardashti. And so when our family uh, moved from Isfahan to Tehran, they became the Dardashtis. Um, and everybody who was a Dardashti was somebody who had originated from that town. Um, and they moved because life was better for Jews um, in Tehran um, in the late 1800s in uh, the big city because there were more Jews. And the Mahale, the Jewish ghetto there where Jews were forced to live separate from Muslims um, was more it was safer because they had their own butchers and their own hospitals and their own and didn't really have to interact as much with um others in the city mm -hmm. have you met other dardashtis oh yeah there are many yeah they're all related to us in some way um and yeah it's a very large large family especially in la you'll find so many Dardashtis who um who are related to us, even though we haven't met all of them. Uh -huh. well, and we've heard from a lot all over the world who've heard the podcast. And so we're we're meeting new ones all all the time uh these last few months. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that's excellent. Um well, so the story, I think, um the story of your grandfather, who was, you know, dubbed the Nightingale of Iran, um, I think is the story of how he's discovered as a singer uh, in Tehran is is a little, it's too good, I think, to maybe, you know, spoil here, but I, I urge people watching to to listen to the, the podcast. It's six episodes, I think they're, you know, between 30 and 40 minutes each. Um, but I wanted to ask you about, about his singing. Um, 
you know, it's, it's this kind of very intense, you know, almost warbling sound that you hear throughout it. And is that, was that the style or was that unique to him? Yeah. So the style that our grandfather sang was called Avaz and it's very unique to Persian classical music. And so if you hear it, it's, you know, it's almost like I'd say the only Western equivalent we have is yodeling. And he, that's a big piece of, of the style. I mean, it's, there's a lot that's similar to other, um, other musics in the region in terms of uh, having quarter tones and that sort of thing. But the, the the style that he used where his voice breaks, yeah, yeah, you know, that I think is what you're, you're referring to. Um, that's probably the best I can do at, t- at 10 a.m. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that is very, that's unique to, um, that's unique to Persian classical music. There's some areas right around, uh, that have um that have a similar uh a similar style but they're you know they're right on the border of iran so some 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 musical styles in iraq right on the border and near in afghanistan but but pretty much it's persian classical music uh, stylistically um so so speaking about about him as as a persian jewish singer um Let's get into that that kind of concept of Motreb that you that you discover um, that was operating in Iran in the sort of fifties and sixties, um, and how it affected the trajectory of your family. If you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, if we could first just sort of give you a little background on who our grandfather was, um, I think it, it it might be helpful. You know, he was our grandfather was a huge star in Iran. Um, in the 1950s and the 1960s, he was um, really beloved among Muslims. And we've always known this. Uh, he sang weekly on the radio and he was known as the Nightingale. And that's where the name of the podcast came from. Um, and he was, yeah, like everyone would be glued to their radio. They'd be listening to him Uh, uh every every single week because he was such a huge star of Persian Persian classical music among everyone. Um, and this is what we had always heard growing up about how our grandfather was this huge star of Persian classical music. And what we explored a little bit in this podcast is this concept of Motreb, which you just which you just asked about. Um, which um, a lot of it in relation to our grandfather was was new to us. So the concept of Motreb is, um, it's hard to explain. We spend a lot of time talking about it in the podcast. Something, yeah, it's something that we, we take two episodes, episode two and three, to really unpack what, um, what this stigma was all about. Um, but we, it was really kind of, um, when Galit and I started trying to look into this story, it never really made sense to us why our family left Iran when they left Iran. Life was really great in Iran for Jews at that time. This was more than 15 years before the Islamic revolution. And that was sort of the impetus for us to start searching and trying to find more about the story and discovering about the Motreb stigma and really understanding the level of importance that it played in our family's lives was the key to sort of understanding why our family would have uh, been able to leave Iran uh, so easily as they did. Um, It was a stigma that existed it's a very complicated thing to explain very quickly but just but just the word itself motreb was a pejorative term for a musician Mm -hmm. that's um that's what motreb um is uh in in iran and that's what we spend a lot of time trying to unpack and understand 
uh, we thought it really didn't relate to actually our family because, as I mentioned, our grandfather was a huge star and was just totally adored in, um, in Iran. But um, as we dug deeper, we started understanding that there was actually maybe more complexity to what we had understood in terms of how this Motreb stigma against musicians impacted our grandfather and our family um, beyond that. And what was surprising to us, because, you know, we always wondered when, when we were told Muslims loved him, you know, we always wondered, like, did they love him? Like, how true? And they loved him. And that was, there was no, no, the difference was that this Motreb stigma existed within the Jewish community. And um, that was something very complicated and difficult for us to digest initially, you know, how he wasn't um, embraced by the Jewish community in quite the same way that he was by the Muslim community, which, um, you know, explained a lot of things and helped us understand some things about how our family felt in Iran. Yeah. Right, because of course that that identity with the Jewish community was was so important. I mean, oh, they were yeah, they were religious Jews who were very involved in the Jewish community, and the, the, how the Jewish community saw them was was very important to them. They weren't. There were other Jewish uh, musicians at the same time who really kind of ended up separating themselves from the Jewish community because of the stigma. Yeah. But, but our I, grandfather, he was asked to lead services for, you know, he would, he would, there was no uh, profession of cantor or chazan in um, the Middle East and North Africa, pretty much. If you were able to, you would be asked to volunteer and lead services. And so our grandfather, as this incredible singer, was asked by multiple uh, um synagogues in Iran to lead them in prayer and he would do that so he was very involved and he would read Torah so they were very very um Judaism was a major part of their lives mm -hmm. and so it was there was always this tension between that you know between being so accepted um by the Muslim community in his uh role as a famous singer on the radio but then not being accepted by the Jewish community. And, and and we unpack all of that in the podcast, explaining why the Jewish community could not accept that. And and it's very compelling the way that you you go about finding this out. And I um and it's interesting because I mean this is so this is so found foundational, fundamental to your family story, to your, your grandfather's, but also your your father's. And so maybe talk a little bit about um this, you know, in the first episode, I think it's called the the time machine, and you, know, you make this discovery in your parents' basement. Um, and I, I was wondering if you talk a little bit about that, and also about what I think is this a little bit of a quirk of your family, but also the kind of um, practicality of of having family, you know, in the U.S. where your father was, you know, I guess starting in 1960. Um, but this this proclivity that your family has for recording all these conversations, um, <laughs> there's a lot of music recorded, but there's a lot of just random not random but just conversational sort of long oh, conversation yeah no you're absolutely right i mean it's um it was a, it was unbelievable because galita and i had actually already decided that we were doing a podcast um about this story before we made that discovery in our parents basement we actually felt that this was an audio story because our grandfather was a radio star and because there are no videos of them in Iran. And we felt like if we were going to make a documentary, it was a much more compelling audio documentary than a video documentary. Mm -hmm. And unless we were going to do animation or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we had already decided we were doing a do an audio documentary. And then um, a couple uh, that winter, my husband and I were living in our parents' house for a few months while we were doing work in our house. And we, um, one day I went down in the basement and 
made this discovery of hundreds and hundreds of audio tapes that were mailed back and forth between Iran and New York over the course of decades, because when our father moved from Iran to America to go to college, in those days, telephone calls, long distance calls were really expensive and traveling overseas was really expensive. And so how they communicated with each other was through audio tapes. And actually, Jennifer, it's not that much of a weird quirk in our family. What we're finding is that in immigrant families at that time, this was a very common way for people to communicate with one another. What they would do is just record their family celebrations and record all kinds of things so that the family overseas could, you know, could be a part of it. And in the, you know, what was, what was unusual about our family is that our family is very musical. And so while other families would tell each other, you know, every day, details and you can hear that in some of what we were able to include in the podcast like oh we got a we got our first telephone today you know they're they're telling in these kind of you know hour multiple hour long uh, um voice messages that they're sending across the world to each other but they were also incredible singers so they would sing for each other and um not only that but you know, our father wasn't able to be in Iran for all of the religious holidays. And we have the most incredible, um, you know, rich uh, recordings because we can hear them. They were, would record an entire Passover Seder in, in Iran. In 1963, we have an entire, their entire Passover Seder in Tehran and things like that. And Galit is right. Like we have hours and hours of tape, but it's not just talking it's singing and oh, it's everything. And I think another thing that's unusual about our family is that they kept everything. So <laughs> there are a lot of families that either haven't yet um, made this kind of a discovery in their parents' basement or their parents didn't hold on to things like our parents did. And um, yeah, and the other thing that's unusual about our family is even after that period of time where it was the necessary way to communicate, Galit and I and, and others in the family also recorded, did a bunch of recordings. Galit interviewed our grandmother on the beach. Um, you know, in episode five, there's this amazing interview between Galit and our grandmother on the beach. And in episode was, six. Yeah, from like 1990. Yeah, in the 90s, Galit and I both inter both separately when we were in Israel, interviewed our grandparents. So, you know, there, there are, yeah, it's just amazing. You know, Danielle, Danielle became a journalist and documentarian. I became an ethnographer and anthropologist. And so we're, you know, we're the kind of people that are interested in, you know, recording our family. And um, so I think that also helped in terms of the, the kind of rich material that, that we had from a long time ago. Right. And I, I think um, we haven't even talked about your mother's side of the family. I mean, there, there's a richness. I mean, so so maybe we could, maybe you could talk about maybe how your parents met, um, you know, mm. that story. And then, you know, I really wanted to kind of talk about your father, uh, Farid's, I don't know if we call it a dilemma, but it's sort of his, his complexity that you know, he was aware of kind of being a Jewish Persian singer. I mean, he was aware of your father's situation and and was kind of a reluctant, I don't know, reluctant singer, but he, he kind of briefly had this spurt of fame, right? And then he decided he was going to come to the United States to study architecture, um, which actually didn't happen. But, um, you know, maybe <laughs> talk about how your parents met, but then also about how your father, um, you know, there was this kind of decision to, to leave meant, or to stay in Iran meant to, would be to censor himself in a sense. He couldn't really be a singer there. Um, yeah, well, you know, what's interesting, Jennifer, is that our father didn't see it at the time as a dilemma at all. Mm -hmm. And only um, only, only recently in our, in our discussions with him because of the podcast, did we sort of 
more deeply discuss this with him. But basically, our father um, was a teen idol in in Iran uh, before he left um, in the early 1960s, late, uh, um, or was that the late 1950s? No, 1961. If right, I, 1961. 1961, he was a famous singer on TV in Iran. And at the same time, our mother was uh, a teenager, a New Yorker, Ashkenazi girl from New York, folk singer, um, and went to the high school of performing arts, you know, yeah, went to the high school of performing arts and was <laughs> um, singing and um, did some a lot of performing of her own. And it's a really amazing story of how my mom and her family ended up at the same place at the same time as, in Israel. as our father in Israel in the summer of 1962 um, on his way to America and on there they were in Israel for the first very first time during the summer of 1962. My mother our mother was 15 years old and our father was 19 years old and um, he became friends with her parents and her entire family, her, her parents and, and her and her sister, they all kind of adopted him um, and said, here's our phone number. My grandmother really did it and said, here's our phone number. When you're in New York, call us. Cause they heard that he was coming to America and they, they took him around and showed him New York and he um, went off to college and. But just to rewind for a second, we can't tell this whole story because it's so amazing about how our parents met. But the but really the background is, is that our father, despite his fame in Iran, he decided he was going to not live in Iran and he was not going to be a musician for reasons that we get into in the podcast. And that was sort of the, the weirdest part of the story for us. Like mm -hmm. the part that made us the most curious of like, how can this story, the story made no sense. The story made no sense. He was 19 years old. He got a television show, a weekly television show. He became a huge star. In Tehran. In Iran, in Tehran. And he, um, six months later, left the country and came to America to go to college. And it wasn't like he, he was going to college in Dover, Delaware at Wesley College. It wasn't like, like he couldn't have postponed that a year or, you know, it just didn't really all add up to us, like what he was running away from. And now it does. And, and so to answer your question about our dad's sort of, it's a complex thing about how our dad perceives this, because I think when you've been telling a story for 60 years, a certain way, it becomes the truth for you. It becomes the story. And so he had never really thought about it beyond the story that he was telling, which was, I became a famous singer by accident, but I was planning to go to college in the U.S. because I wanted to be an architect. And so I left. And that story never really made sense to us. And so we really wanted to understand it further. And we were right. There was something, you know, else to it. And now he has really embraced the way that we are... I mean, we interrogated him badly, like over the course <laughs> of the year, you know, and and he was such an incredible sport about it. And we did it with like, we did it, we interrogated him delicately. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it and Danielle um, is, is, is really pointing to the fact that like our, we, we were just amazed that our 80 year old father was willing to kind of see things a different way than he had his entire life um, to the extent uh, that he was, he was really excited about it. And he was really um, open to hearing this new way we were telling his story that yeah, he, he said to us, 
um, you know, uh, Danielle, were you just about to, to well, tell that? Story? You know, it's like, it, it it's, it's, that's, it's exciting because yeah, he not only came to sort of see his past differently, but he felt so honored yeah. that we were in so interested and wanted to know all of the details of it. And I think he feels really um, touched by the fact that we, that we helped sort of wrestle with the past. And when we he played for him, you know, we played for him uh, the first episode and we were so nervous about how he was going to react to our retelling of his life and his, you know, father's life. And, um, you know, you're just staring at him as, he, you know, he and our mom. Were our, yeah, our mom and dad, we sat them down in my living room and Galit and I were just looking at them while they were listening to the podcast and waiting oh, wow. to see like how they were going to react. And, and when it, it sort of ends, you know, on a cliffhanger, um, episode one, and our father turned to us and, and said, said why did I leave Iran? <laughs> um, because, you know, we sort of leave it uh, as a question at the end of that episode. And he was excited to hear our interpretation. And that was so funny and exciting for us. Yeah, it was a big sort of relief um, that he was not only just supportive that we were doing it a new way, but he was so kind of excited he was like a listener mm -hmm. you know listening right. along and left on that cliffhanger like just like everybody else like why did i leave you know yeah he he's he's so he's so it's such an interesting i mean he seems to like you said he's a good sport but um this it seems like you're bringing him so much information about his own <laughs> yeah own isn't it, it's and, interesting um, it's very funny i mean it's funny with memory and storytelling how that is mm -hmm. you know how you you, you form memories um, about the past by telling stories about the past. And um, you remember things in the way that it makes sense for you. Um, sometimes it's about, you know, not wanting to, to shield yourself from hurt in terms of how you remember things. There's all different ways and reasons right. why we, we choose to remember things in a certain way. Well, and I, I I think, um, you know, that kind of interrogation, I mean, it's not, it's not, not an interrogation in a bad way, it's, but it, it's coming from the two of you who are, you know, uh, along with your, you have a sister, correct? A, a, a younger sister. I mean, you're the product of this kind of chain of events. Um, and, you know, of course your father too, I'll just add that, you know, he, in this kind of, I wouldn't say dilemma, but it's, it's a complex, um, decision and then so be, so he came to the United States and ended up not being an architect but being a singer but and but really adopting the kind of Ashkenazi traditions and songs of your mother's family but just that was predominant in the culture and and even became a cantor and so you know I think it's it's hard to look back on all to interrogate all this and not feel like it was all it all happened in such a really a wonderful way in the sense but um I wanted to ask about kind of how your identities have changed at all or you know, if, if this whole process has, I know you said you wanted to, you you set out to want to better understand your family and, and better understand yourselves. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Danielle and I have very different answers uh, to this question, um, just in terms of where we were on our journeys. Uh, I went to grad school, applied to graduate school as a young woman, um, originally to do research on our grandfather. And I thought I was going to get to go to Iran. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to explore that side of my family heritage. And I wasn't able to go to Iran because the politics <laughs> would have been very dangerous for me. Um, our grandfather, you know, he used to sing for the Shah. You know, he used to travel back and forth between Iran and uh um, and in Israel for, for many years after they immigrated. So um, it what ended up happening was that I explored both as an anthropologist uh, studying 
Mizrahi culture in Israel and learning to sing Persian classical music and um, really mining our father for, for details. So there was a lot more that I knew. And, um, and, you know, I, in September released this album where I actually sing with our grandfather that I've been working on for many, many years where I, you know, I sample his recordings. It's called Munajat. And I, take these recordings that he had um, the one of the only recordings we have of him singing, not in Persian, but in Hebrew, him singing religious music. So I've been playing around with this material for a long time and have been thinking through some of these issues. So I would say that it ha it's, it, this has been a part of my journey, but um and I definitely learned from this process. Danielle and I asked different questions that I never got a chance to ask because since I wasn't able to go to Iran, my research much more shifted to Israel and to and to understanding the journey of Mizrahim and their culture and music, mm -hmm. but much less in the end, the journey of our grandfather. So it's been amazing for me to be able to answer some of these questions, but I wouldn't say that it it's changed my my identity because I've been on this journey for, for many years. And I think Danielle's answer will be a bit different. Yeah, from my perspective, so I have always been a storyteller, but I have never delved into our family story and have not um, this this kind of material about uh, Iranians and about Mizrahi culture it was completely new to me. I actually got in, interested in doing this project because I wanted to tell the story of our grandfather and our father. Um, I really didn't realize initially that this was our story too, that we were telling a story about us too. I really thought I was doing a documentary sort of more in the you know, third person initially um, about our grandfather. And... Um, as things started unfolding and we found all of the tapes and we were having these really amazing conversations with our father and with each other and discovering things, it became clear that this was our story too. And really the way that the podcast is framed is, you know, episode one and six are really about us and our story. And then episodes two through five really go into our grandfather and our father's stories. But I didn't see it that way initially. I really didn't realize I was on a journey initially figuring out my own identity and um, where I ended up with this project. It was pretty amazing and overwhelming for me. I, you know, I kind of joked in the beginning about how un-Persian I was um, making this podcast. And um, I'm a little less un-Persian <laughs> today, but I wouldn't say, yeah. I wanted to ask about that because that, uh, I think, I'm not sure how old both of you were, but you... You moved to Los Angeles um, and, you know, your father became a cantor and, but were you, were you close to the, the sort of Persian Jewish community there? Not at all. I mean, not really. Our father, at least we were exposed to it. We would get invited to Persian weddings. And so, uh, you know, we would, but we really weren't, we weren't, in, no. we weren't part of it. Our father was an Ashkenazi cantor. He was an Ashkenazi cantor in LA and we have, we had cousins like distant cousins um, that lived near us in LA. So we would be invited to those bar mitzvahs and weddings, but really our father didn't have that many Persian friends oh. in LA. His mm -hmm. friends, um, you know, it was, LA was the only time in our lives that we even lived near a Persian Jewish community and had some exposure to Persian culture, but very little. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 90% of our lives was a very 
basic Jewish Ashkenazi upbringing, even in LA. In the podcast, in um, episode six, you know, we talk about that year when we first were in LA that our father sort of tried to forge a relationship with the Persian community. Um, but I think some of those Motreb, um, you know, there were, it brought back some things for him and, um, yeah. And it was, it, 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 so it didn't really work out between him and them. And, and so it didn't really, yeah, it didn't really become a thing for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Episode six is all about Los Angeles. And, and what I wanted to ask about, I mean, your family, I mean, you kind of say this is the story of a family band and I think you're talking about your larger family, but, but your, your sort of immediate family, um, you, when you were kids, like you had a band. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, I, I want, I, I want to say you, you said you sang in, I don't know how many different languages it was like 10 or something. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. We say 12. I don't know. It could have been more, but, um, <laughs> We can count up to 12, but there may have been more that we didn't count. But yeah, but not in Persian. Not in Persian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that actually was that conversation that Galid and I had with our parents about why didn't we sing in Persian um, was a conversation that kind of really made it clear to us that this was our story also. Mm -hmm. um and 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 really an interesting way to frame the story of our past definitely yeah and and i want to so i wanted to mention galit the 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 song that it's kind of the theme song that you mentioned you know you took these recordings of your, your grandfather um it's just it's it, it really is amazing i mean it, it really grabs you um i loved it mm -hmm. <laughs> um it still grabs me every single time I hear it. And I've heard it like a million times. It's so good. <laughs> Her whole album is like that. But that that song is the first song on the album, Mona Jat. So what is, what is it that you hope people really take away from this, um, you know, in terms of history, but also in terms of the moment we're at right now? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that we're really hoping is that people will hear this podcast, hear about a time where it was not unusual that our grandfather, who eventually immigrated to Israel in the 1960s and was traveling back and forth between Israel and Iran, you know, he was basically commuting to Iran from Israel, that that seemed normal, that the relationships that exist currently didn't always they didn't always have to be that way and that you know um we're talking about this this moment in history that we really want people to understand in terms of the way culture was shared between Jews and Muslims and especially in episode 2 um it's one of our favorite episodes where we interview um, a man named Habib Partel, who was uh, a good friend of our grandfather's, and he was a religious Muslim. And their their relationship, I think, is is a story that you're, you're just not hearing. This is the kind of story that you're really not hearing very much right now, in terms of how a mess the Middle East is. And it's a really beautiful story that shows that for 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 different different historical periods, we can't say that it was always beautiful and perfect because it wasn't. But there were these um, there were absolutely uh, parts of history, parts of history where where Jews and Muslims were were able to um, to connect and. Um, uh, make music together, learn from each other, and and we hope we hope it can be that way again. And I think it also shows that like things can change because this period of time that we're talking about came after five hundred really dark years for Jews in Iran, and um, you know it's just. 
people you're in a moment in, in politically or even personally in your in per, someone's life where you think things are always going to be this way and that it's a permanent situation and i think what our story shows is that things can change and um so yeah the the history is not uh, linear and mm -hmm. things move in in really strange and unsurprising ways sometimes definitely looking at the history of of Iranian Jews i mean in i in 1979 sort of on the eve of of the revolution there were i think like 80,000 Jews in Iran. And and then, you know, now I think there's like 9,000, 12,000, something like that. Um, I mean, do you, well, I guess a couple of questions. I know a lot of these, the, the recordings of your father and your grandfather were destroyed. And so like how, how I mean, the, 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 the recordings you used, where did those come from? Were those just personal recording? Right. So there, there are some, there are some recordings that, um, that are, everywhere that are on the internet. There are recordings that people recorded just off the radio. Um, that's where a lot of them came from. And there were some recordings from the radio that were released as albums. So that's basically what we what we think was destroyed or erased or hidden um, are the many, many recordings that our grandfather uh, did on the radio because um, yeah, nobody, nobody, we've tried, we've tried to, to get them and we, we haven't successfully been able to, it's possible that they exist, but we think that when the Islamic revolution came in, that they, um, you know, they erased all of, all of that, that was happening previously. Um, he, his, he had a weekly show on the radio and it was tears. It was for years, for like a decade, he had a, a weekly show on the radio and it was taped and then, um, you know, aired later. And um, so those recordings, it wasn't like it was a live show, not recorded. It was um, it was a recorded show. And our father's show on TV was a live show, but it's unclear whether it was ever recorded in the first place or if those were destroyed, but yeah. we don't have any, we've never seen, we have a couple of photos of it, but we haven't seen or heard those recordings. Interesting. Another mystery. <laughs> maybe to try. Yeah, maybe, maybe one day, maybe one day they'll be well, found. But... I guess I, I think that we all want to know if you're going to do another season of this. Well, you know, we feel really, really satisfied with the story that we told. Um, and we feel like it is very complete as far as there's always more. I mean, we have yeah. like a million tapes. There's so much, but we feel really satisfied with the story that we told about our family. Um, there could be other iterations of the yeah. story that we did tell. Yeah. And that will, uh, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that is to be continued. We also have heard from a lot of people all over the world um, in response to our story with other tangential stories that they're telling us um, that could potentially be um, either spin-off season, spin-off series or new projects. Um, we've also heard from Jews in Tehran now who um who've lived in Tehran all their lives you know who who are still there some with very very compelling stories um and who are sharing their stories with us so um but we don't want to jeopardize their safety um yeah. so it's a really difficult situation knowing how to how to handle that and whether to create a podcast series without revealing their names or a, you know, so, so we're, we're, um, we're thinking about all of it and it's been so exciting. We've been hearing from people all over the world, you know, Jewish, Muslim, um, from all different countries. And it's, it's really been very exciting for us. I imagine. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I, I, I'm sure you'll keep hearing from people. Um, I, I wanted to touch on something, you know, just kind of, bigger picture. I mean, towards the end of the last episode, Danielle, you're um, 
kind of funny. Your husband comes in very briefly. You're you're kayaking, and as the, the Dardashti way, you're recording it as you're kayaking. <laughs> um, but you, I think, what you don't hear, but I imagine you're kind of ruminating on what is this all about, and and you you ask him. Um, you say so. The the key to retaining your culture is being marginalized. You kind of ask, is that is that the key? Um, how does this fit with your your grandfather's and your father's story? And and is this kind of a larger inquiry about the Jewish people? Yeah, you know, it's funny that that question. What you you're absolutely right that that was a larger conversation that was edited out of the of episode six because it kind of was going in another tangent a little bit. Um, the that conversation happened right as the moment that the sun started to set on the pond and it was just sort of a, a crazy thing because I really was talking about um, that metaphor of the sun setting was such something that was so um, I was so obsessed with during the pandemic of like racing against time to record and tell our family stories and and learn about our family stories while this generation is still alive of that you know all of the contemporaries of our father who we spoke with who gave us information to put together his story um so it's funny because that conversation with my husband was much longer in episode six initially, but edited down. And yeah, I think that it does. Um, it's 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 a part of all of it, um, really understanding how. How the Jewish story, um, how how our family story is very sort of representative of the Jewish story and, um, you know, dealing with uh, adversity and how much of that is really a part of what we've achieved. I don't know. I mean, it's really, it's a sad sort of a question to say, you know, do we need that adversity in order to have achieved some of the things that we've gotten? I don't know. Um, Gali, do you want to say anything about that question, that that conversation? No, no I think that yeah. was your conversation. <laughs> yeah, it was like, a, it was a very, it was, yeah, I mean, I, this was a very emotional project for me and a very sort of existential kind of a project for me. And I had those kinds of conversations and recorded those kinds of conversations all over the place uh, during that year. Um, yeah. Of uh, and it, and it was just a, it was a, it, it was like you said, Danielle was recording her conversations and it just beautifully kind of you know, what she was talking about, it worked within that, with, within that episode and it just reflected kind of the emotional feelings we were having about, you know, about, about the story and about telling it. Well, and it was also just this metaphor of not only were we talking about struggling and what kind that adversity leads to, but right at that moment, we our our kayak is like pulled into like this kind of part of the pond where it's difficult to paddle and there's all these lily pads but then it's really beautiful there and it leads to something really beautiful and so that difficult moment kind of led to a new discovery and it was that in it in and of itself was like a metaphor for what happened this, you know, with this project and the discovery that we've made and how sometimes, you know, uncovering difficult things leads to, um, leads to other things that are, that are really satisfying. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, for, for people who come, if they, if you come from a family of storytellers, I think, I, most people do, but I think there are some families that just, you know, they, they, they're really into their stories and, and, you know, I mean, I know my family is, but, but it just, I guess the message here is just, there's always more to the story, right? <laughs> yeah. There is. And, you know, and one of the things that's been so gratifying for Galit and I is 
hearing a lot of people say that our podcast has kind of motivated them to interview their parents and and get their stories on tape because I think that it's something that no you'll never regret doing that. You'll never regret interviewing your parents and recording. And we all have these devices that we carry around with us where the sound quality is so good on our iPhones that, you know, a lot of the conversations that you're hearing between Galit and I and between my husband and I and between, they were recorded on iPhones. Um, and so I think, you know, yeah, there's no time like the present, just hit record. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> yeah, that's great advice. Um, well, this has been wonderful talking to you both. And uh, I, I know this is, obviously a very personal project. And um, I look forward to, you know, following your, you know, your other work. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Great. Great.